may be seated. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text for today's message is the Gospel from John 20, previously read. Well, it has been a quiet week in Lake Beauregard, my hometown. The mayor, Theodore Bayer, is taking the evening to sit on his front porch and soak in the symphony that is Lake Beauregard on a hot summer's night. The youth of Galilee Lutheran and St. Polycarp Catholic Church are out on the softball field in the city park playing a game against each other. It used to be that the youth groups had enough teams to play in their own denomination across the country. But you know what it's like as towns closed in. They used to play teams in Upham, in Omimi, and in Drexel, and in Malvo, and in Couts. But now, there are so few youth that the Lutherans have taken to play against the Catholics. Pastor Olmsted and Father Percelli, they take turns catching when it's their team pitching and umpiring when it's the other team. They're getting up that age, they find it the path of least resistance and fewest steps. Taking turns catching and umpiring, they don't even have to walk back to the dugout between innings. They just have to go back to that jug back at the backstop. The youth all joke that there's more in that jug besides water, but they're at that age where they realize on a hot summer's day they'd better just put water in that. There's horns honking on Main Street. Not many horns, just a few passing vehicles. On Sunday night they roll up the sidewalks, as they say. There are no businesses open. So Thelma's taking the opportunity to go out and hose down the sidewalk really good. A while back, they had one of those sidewalk sales in front of the Wobbly Cart Grocery. And they had set up a table of jams and jellies, homemade jams and jellies, left over from the state fair, the ones that didn't win. Uh, they were out to sell a second chance. And Missy Sorensen, who's still trying to figure out how to ride her bike, is riding down that sidewalk. She just did not know how to stop before she hit that table. Jams and jellies everywhere. They cleaned up the glass as best as they could, but it's hard to clean up jams and jellies that have melted in the summer sun, and they seeped into the cracks in the sidewalk, and there are a lot of cracks in that sidewalk, and that sidewalk kind of became a theme park for ants. Ants overtaking the wobbly cart, ants overtaking the restaurant next door. And one day in the morning, as Thelma was serving the more first cup of coffee to the regulars, all of a sudden Alvina Crabmore jumped up as though she had seen a revelation of angels coming from on high. It turned out a trail of ants had started walking up her legs. We don't know what she used for perfume, but the ants seemed to really love it. A trail of ants jumping up and down her legs, Alvina jumping up and down and running out, and that's just not good for business. So. Alvina's out there taking care of things with a good strong hose, trying to wash that jam and jelly out of the cracks and taking care of the ants. And all of this is set to the metronome of the pulsing sprinkler and, uh, and Mildred Rothgarn's uh, garden out in front of her house. There used to be a 12-foot pine tree with a few branches missing on one side, but a couple of years back, Cletus Thingbold thought it would be a good idea to cut that tree down and Use it as a bribe to try to get his son Halver into the Christmas play at Galilee Lutheran Church. Pastor Olmsted gave him the benefit of the doubt that Halver had stage fright and didn't get the part anyway. So Mildred was out of, out of pine tree and nothing to show for it. So, trying to make up for it, Cletus uh, hauled in some very nice field stones for a board. And she planted her flowers there, but the, the ground with all that pine straw, it, it, it leaches out some of the, the good elements. And so uh, Cletus heard that rotted manure was good for uh, gardens, so he brought in a load of rotted manure. Now, most people would use rotted cow manure, but Cletus had a good deal from a pig farm. Not quite the same aroma, not quite the 
not quite the invisibility factor after a few weeks. Folks who drive down Main Street and catch a whiff of that coming off of Mildred's Flower Garden said they think they've ended up in the middle of Iowa. Sorry, Iowa. <laughs> but Mayor takes it all, Mayor Bear takes it all in from his front porch and just to him it is music to his ears and even the smell of roses and pig neuter coming from Mildred's. This home. And he's trying to get other people to see that wonderful gift of home that Lake Beauregard is and can be. In particular, he is out on his porch making use of that new cell phone service they've got in Lake Beauregard, just came in a couple years ago, to call Thomas Vandergeest. Thomas is the grandson of Gustav Vandergeest. Vandergeest Farm is about seven miles in the opposite direction of town from the lake. Vandergeest have grown almost everything on that farm over the years. They have a great big barn out there with a name like Vandergeest. You need a lot of barn to put it on there. And so they had Vandergeest Farms painted up on the side. It, they kind of did the math wrong. So instead of Vandergeest Farms, it says Vandergeest Farm. And Gustav was too cheap to build another 10 feet of barn onto the end to get the S on there. Figured it was good enough as it was. Turns out they didn't need it that long. The ground out there just wasn't as good as the ground in other places. They made a living, not a good living, and Thomas was one of those who found it very expedient to leave town to find his fame and fortune. Thomas thought that he found a better place almost every place he went. And there were a lot of places that he went to find a job that paid more, to find a place that had good fishing, to find a place that he could be close to family, his and his spouses, to find a place where he could find the kind of friends that he would cherish as friends. The mayor there is on the phone trying to talk him into coming back to find the treasure that he left behind. What more do you want? Teddy asks. Thomas says, you don't know what it's like out here. I can go in a restaurant and get food done any way I want. And Mayor Bear says, well, you can do that down at Thomas. You know that she's a good cook. You know, you know that you can order anything you want. If it's on the menu or not. If she doesn't have it, she'll go next door and get it. She'll fix it up any way you want. Thomas comes back with excuses. Well, I'm close to family out here. The mayor says, what are you talking about? You have more family here and uh, Lake Beauregard and the uh, Lake County than you'd ever find anywhere else. Well, you don't know the kind of friends I got out here. I got friends that would do anything for me. And again, Mayor says, don't you realize that you've got even better friends here that are just waiting for you to come back, begging you to come back, fix up your old folks' place, and find the treasure that you left behind. What more do you want? Thomas is facing the same kind of situation the disciple Thomas, the apostle Thomas, is facing the same kind of situation the week after Jesus rose from the dead. He had a home. With the disciples, he had a home. He had a family. He had constant food. He had the best kind of food in the Lord's Supper, which he had already taken part of. But, with the way things, not the way they used to be, he thought he'd find greener pastures somewhere else. The disciples came after him, calling him, not with cell phones, but calling him on him in person, saying, what more do you want? Come back to the family. We have seen. We have seen the good things that Jesus did. He appeared in front of us. He gave us his peace. He gave us a blessing. He gave us the forgiveness of sins to breathe on all people. Come back and be with us. But Thomas wanted more. He wanted to know for himself. Unless I see the nail prints in his side and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. The disciples simply could say, come and see. Come. Come home. Come home and see this wonderful thing that has been done. And God will do for you even more. Gideon, in our Old Testament lesson, he is called to a, a people that is not what it used to be. 
In Gideon's day, the people of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Lord was not pleased with them, and he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. In Gideon's days, the farms were not producing what they should, not what they used to. Not because the ground was bad, but they would plant and the Midianites would come in and just ravage their fields. Israel had no army. They had no way of defending themselves. They were at a loss to the enemy who would simply trample their means of existence. And so Gideon was called by the Lord to go serve the people. And Gideon says, I can't do this. Isn't that the way we feel when we're faced with difficulties? When we're faced with new challenges in life? Isn't our first response a lot of times, I can't do this? Yes, so it was with Gideon. Did you like that story? Did you like what God did for Gideon? Do you wish God would do the same thing for you? Take a piece of fleece. Here's, here's the deal, God. I'm going to take a piece of fleece, and I'm going to set it out on the ground. Now, come morning, I want the fleece to be wet, but the ground dry. In the morning, it was so. Would that be enough for you? I think so. Would that be good enough? Yeah. You ask God to do something once, and he does it once, and you say, that's good enough. Okay, yeah. yeah. Forget it. He says, okay, 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 okay. Let's try it this time. I'll put the fleece out there again. This time the fleece should be dry and the ground wet. If I was God, and let's face it, if you were God, would you be patient with Gideon? What more do I have to do for you? What more do you want? How many times do I have to show you? Nevertheless, he goes out the next morning, and was he fine? Fleece dry, ground wet. Does that give you confidence, Gideon? And now, you know the rest of the story. Gideon gathered an army, and it was too big, so he left a bunch of them behind. They went, and the, they did cause all kinds of ruckus, and the enemy basically defeated themselves, and the Israelites were free to once again prosper from the fruits of their own land. They got what they wanted, and even more. Paul writes to the Ephesians, and he says, I'm going to give you what you need. It is God who will give you these things. It was God who gave us all these wonderful gifts. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, the building up of the body of Christ. It was He who gave me to you. It was He who gave you to me. And yet along the way, there have been times when I have asked God, are you sure? Are you sure this is what you have in store? During the building project and those endless delays and the cost overruns, the lift that would never leave, all the other problems, and I'd moan and gripe and complain because that's what pastors do when they're not in front of you. We find other pastors and we moan and gripe and complain. You should see a bunch of pastors get together. It's hilarious to those of you who are new to the scene. Am I right? I am right. Pastor Meski is chuckling and smiling and nodding. Yes, we love to complain. But God has also surrounded you with fellow pastors who are short to the word. And when I say, I don't know if I can do this anymore, their words to me were simply, do you have a call? Well, yeah, I got a call. Do you have a divine call? Did God call you to this position? Are you saying God made a mistake? Oops. Yeah, there are times when I have lived out my namesake of Doubting Thomas. And so I wanted to use these texts as a reading for tonight. It so happens that this feast day of Thomas is exactly five months removed from its appropriate date. The Feast of St. Thomas is originally set for December 21st, the dimmest day of the year. I kid you not. And I think it's apt. I don't know why St. Thomas gets the dimmest day of the year, the day of the winter solstice. But I do know that when I am in doubt, the world seems incredibly dark. But just a few days after the celebration of St. Thomas and his doubt, the light of the world enters, and the days here in the Northern Hemisphere get brighter 
and brighter and brighter. So have the days here at Zion. The building that I thought would never get finished got finished. And then we had a bunch of debt. It was over seven figures. This is a boy who was raised on $3.35 an hour right, at his day job, who went to North Dakota and built an entire building for $78,000. We spent more than that on architects. And when the debt ballooned over seven figures, one million dollars, never had I encountered that before. And again, I doubt it. There's no way we're going to pay this thing off. The situation went from bad to worse. See, I told you, there's no way we're going to pay this thing off. We're going to, the whole church is going to implode with the debt. And then God provided a way. The fleece was wet, the ground was dry. The ground was dry, the fleece was wet. Time and again, God showed himself to me as he showed himself to Thomas. And he has continued to lift me up by the pastors that he has given to me. Pastor Mesky, Pastor Waltz, Pastor Bartow, Pastor Lynn, Pastor Buck, Pastor Bob, Pastor Sandy, and on down the list. God has raised a sheep up to comfort their shepherd. And that has helped this shepherd comfort the sheep. What more do you want? God has asked. And boy, I have given him a bunch of answers. If only, if only, if only. And even though we should not put God to the test, doggone it if he didn't come back almost every single time and do just that if only. And how can I keep doubting? Well, now I've got another call. And after I sat through the meetings up there, I, 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 went, I talked to Mary and said, there's no way I can do this. It's, it's too much. I, I can't do this. The congregation is dead. They've got a school. They can't do this. They the, had a church full of people each talking about their expectations, and I went home and said, I can't do this. I can't do this. Yet, yeah, God opened my heart to say, yeah, this is, this is what you're going to do, and don't worry, I'm going to be with you. I'll be with you where you go. And now I hear from some of the people in this congregation. Some people have just remarkable faith and just, you know, well, it will be what it will be. Um, we'll cry a few tears, we'll call another pastor, and everything will go on, and, and that's the way it goes. And God bless you if that's the kind of faith you have. A lot of uh, people are having doubts that it's been 16 years, and now we have to start this, and how long is this going to take, and what, what's going to happen? I don't know. But am I confident? Yes. I don't know where you're going, but I have faith in God. That God is still the shepherd of the church, and He will provide. So what more do you want? He has a promise that it is God who will give apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And then it says, We shall not be like children, tossed to and fro by the waves, and carried about by every wind of doctrine, human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we will grow up in every way into him who is the head, even Jesus Christ our Lord. What more do you want? There it is. It's right here. The treasure that you seek is under your feet. The treasure that you seek is there every week in the Word and in the sacraments. God revealing Himself to be the good God. He always has been, is today, and always will be. The treasure is right there in the friendships that you guys share in the pew. The friendships that you have shared with me, the love and care and concern you have shown for me, you also love, care, and show for one another. The treasure is right there under your feet and will continue to be there for ages to come. Mayor Bayer, Mayor Teddy Bear, he's calling Thomas Vanderbees to come home, but he's holding out on him. 
He's holding out one little piece of information that might make the whole trip worthwhile, but he doesn't want him to take it for the wrong reasons. He wants him to come home to Lake Beauregard, to once again be a part of the fabric of the community, to be among family and friends who care for him, to enjoy the bad coffee at Thelma's because it's shared with good friends, to enjoy the spectacle of Alvina Cradmore jumping up in high heel shoes and running out the door. He wants Thomas to be a part of a community where you can go into church and everybody knows your name. But what he doesn't tell Thomas until Thomas actually does come back is that Gustav had the good sense to get mineral rights to his land. And that a little tiny band of the Bakken Oil Reserve sits right under his property. There's going to be a few notes added to the symphony in the days and weeks to come as the construction trucks come to build new homes. As Thomas is going to have to load up on the food, as hardware Hank is going to have to load up on the lumber, and as the drilling rigs come to town, God does his best work in raising up the dead. And that work is way to be happening at Lake Beauregard, my hometown. And that's the news from Lake Beauregard, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children above average. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.